All right, next up we have Andre Schmeikoff giving a talk called PCB Ops, Applying CI, CD to PCB Design Projects. Andre is an electrical engineer and firmware developer with a focus on data acquisition, embedded systems, industrial automation, and CI, CD and manufacturing operations. As an electrical engineer at a small industrial device manufacturer, he has experienced many aspects of PCB design and manufacturing. In a, previous late, in a previous life, he studied physics and math at UC Berkeley, where he enjoyed developing embedded devices using KiCad in his lab and academic work. Please welcome him to the stage. Hello. All right. Can you hear me? Is that a good location? OK. Hi. Uh, I'm Andre. Um, thanks for the introduction. So. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk about um, CI/CD, which is basically continuous integration, continuous deployment. It's automation of the design and release process. Um, but before we start, uh, I'm new to this community. I wanted to give a little bit about myself. It also puts me at ease when I'm in front of an audience. Keep jogging. Thank you. Um, I come from San Francisco Bay Area. This is an unusually pretty picture of the area. This happens uh, within 24 hours of a nice rain. You've probably never seen Silicon Valley look that nice either. Uh, very green, so that's uh, um, leading into the fact I like to hike a lot. This is from uh, the Sierra Crest, uh, entering Kings Canyon National Park. There's uh, 20 named glaciers in California. One of them is on this picture uh, right there. That's a, um, a Darwin Glacier. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there. The, the size of it has uh, shrunk from approximately covering the whole basin to just that location right there. I like to hike. Those are some of my friends and my girlfriend, and we're uh, out in the woods. Uh, I also like maps. So this is a map of the San Francisco Bay Area overlaid upon a map that was generated from about 150 years ago showing um, uh, the landfill that has been introduced to the area since then. Uh, so you can see in the little shadow area, if you've driven the Bay Bridge from uh, San Francisco to Oakland, you've driven through a tunnel. Uh, they excavated the tunnel and they filled up this island right here. They call it Treasure Island. They're going to be putting 20,000 people on there as soon as they can. Anyway, moving on. Introduction. Uh, what is continuous integration, continuous deployment? Um, just kind of as a, a quick show, uh, how many people here have some experience with this in software projects and design projects? Great, fantastic. You probably know this little guy right here. He's very popular on GitHub, uh, Mr. Travis here. They also come in, in uh, other gender and other um, uh, colors, basically, in, in this logo. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is GitLab CI CD. It's, uh, it's a pro platform that I prefer. Uh, the reason for that is uh, it's self-deployed and self-hosted compared to GitHub. So when I run it in my organization, I control everything. Uh, but they're equally OK. So there's nothing wrong with using either one. So uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, CI-CD uh, basically refers to end-to-end -end automation of the development and the release process. And this can apply to software and hardware. I apply it to, you know, my own presentations and projects, whatever. So there's no real constraint as to where it can be applied. It's also, in my opinion, it's a mindset. Um, there's a tendency, I feel, in, in PCB industries to lock things down. They don't want to change. Uh, and, and CICD requires you to let go of that uh, and, uh, and uh, believe that changes are natural and that they can be accommodated with a controlled process. Uh, and lastly, it requires version control. So hopefully you attended one of the other talks that covered version control. If not, please uh, review them online. But you need to use uh, Git. Uh, SVN is also acceptable. Whatever you want, use version control. <clears throat> anyway, so what are the benefits? Uh, before I get into the details, what are the benefits? Um, you don't need to do anything. You, you, you make your changes, you commit, you sit back and relax, you get all of your outputs. You get your Gerbers, you get your drawings, uh, the software people get their board support package, uh, the mechanical designer gets their uh, um, 3D model. Everybody's happy. Nobody's sitting there at uh, 2 in the morning figuring out why their compiler 
or their program isn't working, generating Gerbers correctly. Uh, there are fewer mistakes. Uh, this generation process, uh, I find, is very error prone. Uh, so when you automate it, you write it once, you never have to change the checkbox. Oh crap, did I forget to check the box for tenting all vias or didn't? Uh, did I forget to check in the Gerber, put pads in between layers across the pad stack for a via, or did I not? Does my manufacturer know how I want it? Right, so these are all mistakes that happen. They lead to boards that don't work when you get them. We want to eliminate that. Uh, lastly though, so it's a channel for collaboration. When the hardware designer is working in their little silo, nobody sees that output uh, in a traditional sense until they're done. Uh, when you have continuous integration, you're up, as you're updating the project, every person that's involved in that project will see the outputs live as the project is progressing. They're able to take that, a mechanical designer can take the model, they can po poke you and say, hey, uh, the screw hole's in the wrong place, or this component's interfering with this other component, you're gonna have to move it. And this can be happening continuously, as opposed to really strict check-in points, maybe once a quarter or whenever your project is done. Uh, that's not to say that this is only geared to corporate customers. Uh, I am trying to address um, the hobby market as well, so I'll, I'll get to that right now. So, uh, channel for collaboration applies to open source projects as well as to people in corporate environments. What are the caveats? Uh, don't always trust the system. When you automate things, often uh, people like to forget it. Well, occasionally you have to revisit it, so you should have a review process for your review process. Right, uh, don't get complacent, so that means uh, if things need to change, go and fix them. Uh, otherwise, if you need a short circuit, you know, uh, in the sense that you wanna make something happen quicker, don't try to bypass the system and do it manually, that's when change, uh, mistakes get introduced again. Right, uh, stable workflow, meaning if you know how you work and what steps you want, if it's stable, it's, it's helpful, uh, but if you're good at scripting, you can accommodate your workflow changes live if you want. So, software development folks have DevOps, and here's the DevOps pipeline, very stereotypical one for, um, for software development. You test, you build, you deploy. Maybe us hardware folks, we can have PCB ops. Uh, and so here's my stereotypical pipeline. You do rules check, DRC, ERC, you do your build, you release your bomb, engineering drawings, Gerbers, pick and place files, step files, et cetera. Obviously these can be part of one job, they don't have to be split up this way. And then your release. Uh, and then post-release we have other uh, possible options. Uh, so, a sample workflow, so, uh, let me go back for a second. So this is, this is something that I have applied from a workflow that I personally use. There's nothing in the system that requires you to use my workflow. This is from my experience working in a small hardware manufacturer. Uh, but this hardware manufacturer, we sell parts into the semiconductor industry, which is a little bit like aviation and medicine where nothing can change ever. Uh, I mean, I mean ever. The difference is that it's not the government coming after us, it's our customers coming after us and saying, hey, what did you do? We're no longer buying from you. So in that, pro in that context, uh, as the electrical engineer, or uh, as the electrical engineer and working under a more senior engineering manager, uh, there's a lot of manual steps that I have to do pretty much daily during a release process. To make sure the rules are checked uh, when we release, I have to make sure that those rules are the right rules because often people have 10 files for rules, which one are you loading? Uh, I have to make sure that the bombs are correct, that no part has randomly changed manufacturer part number, make sure the engineering drawing notes are consistent because if a manufacturer sees two drawings, one has a note and the other doesn't, and they don't want to do that note, they're gonna ignore it, right? So, so that's, uh, uh, that's just something to consider. Uh, same thing with the Gerbers and, and all the other files that get released. It's, just, it's really easy when they start stacking up and when you have multiple projects to just make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, it costs you money. And so this is all about saving your sanity, saving your mental health, and in the long run, saving you money uh, when you design boards and, 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 and produce boards. Right, so what's this workflow based on? Well, it's just general engineering practices, um, a little bit stream, uh, focused on the uh, 
control change kind of environment that I work in, but it's, it's pretty general in that sense. But uh, what we have is, or at least I propose, four macroscopic steps. So we're in the design phase. I'm working with a mechanical engineer. I'm working with a software engineer. It could be you. You could be wearing the same hat. It doesn't mean that these are different people, but you're, you're switching back and forth in different environments. You, you don't want to have all of these environments at the same computer at the same time. Um, when you're done with your design portion, when you're actively collaborating with all the other engineers that know all the technical details of what you're working on, you move on to a review state where you look at everything you've created and you make sure that you uh, haven't made, you know, you, you, you haven't made big mistakes. Uh, but also you make sure that you comply with all, those, all the silly things that you kind of don't care about while you're developing. That every, well, in my case, every resistor and capacitor has to have a part number. I don't want to deal with that when I'm laying this board out. Like, I want to deal with that when I'm done. And that's something that can be part of the review process. Um, when you're done with the review, uh, you have final production files, and you send them out for request for quote. So you're sending it to a manufacturer, hey, what do you think about this? At that point, uh, you can either get back your design saying, okay, you move on to release, or your manufacturers say, no, this is wrong, don't do this, and you can either hot fix them or uh, return and cycle the loop again. So I try to associate the design or each one of these workflow steps with a specific version control um, context or concept. So the design phase is branching and committing. So if you're working in Git, you're working in GitLab or GitHub or whatever, uh, you collaborate by using version control commits. You collaborate by using different branches. Uh, the technical details of how to do comparisons between PCBs on different branches, that's something that needs to be hashed out uh, in the KiCad, KiCad community. By the way, I'm, I'm not a pre prescriptivist, so either one works for me. Personally, I use KiCad. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of tools and missing, missing plugins or, or, or uh, scripting languages, what have you. Uh, but uh, that will maybe in the future enable more direct comparison in the side of the system. But for now, we're just going to look at them as commits. So the developers, while they're generating their, their uh, design files, they're creating commits on uh, the history of that file. The commits have a log message, but also each one of these, you can go in and you can comment on it. And also, going back to our sample pipeline, every time, every commit has all of these things generated. Uh, so person who's going back to review can look, hey, oh, look, in this commit, this is what the Gerbers look like, this is what the drawings look like, this is what the rules said. And you can see where rules fail or rules start to pass, it's, you know, certain things like this that even right now may be not that important, but when you look back at them maybe a year later, uh, they become very, very important. And uh, I found that through experience, basically. Um, right. So after you're done with your design, uh, what do you do? You review. Uh, all the stakeholders weigh in. And, and, and I'm using these kind of buzzy words, stakeholders, uh, on the previous page, collaborate. Uh, th you know, we like to think that you know, we're, we're as hobbyists, and, and I come here as a hobbyist to, to talk to you, that you know we're above the corporate stuff, and w and we are in some ways. Uh, but what it what it really means is, hey, I'm interested in this board working correctly. Uh, my customers, or maybe these are backers that you have, or maybe it's just your friends who really want to see this cool project done, uh, or it's people that have technical stake in whatever you're working on. Well, they need some input, and, and it's hard for them to always give input when you're in the middle of the design phase, because what happens in the design phase? Uh, well, things are changing fast. And a lot of times, you know, it's not very useful to have people constantly looking at them. But in the review phase, that's when everybody can sit down and look at it together. So how do you do this in a Git context? What does that mean? Well, you submit a merge request, or if you're on GitHub, it's called a pull request. Uh, so that generates a request to take the code, or in this case, the design that you have, and move it into the production branch. Um, this is also a good time to take care of Annoying things, uh, your style guides, make sure your notes are correct, the bombs are correct, all the manufacturer part numbers align. There's, there's lots of small details that you just don't want to take care of while you're working. So you do this during the review phase. 
So what happens after review? Well, let's say everybody's happy. Well, you go to pre-release. What happens in pre-release? Uh, you do request for quotation. You're saying, again, manufacturer, please take a look what I've made. Tell me if it's OK. And if it's OK, how much are you going to charge me? Uh, and what pro changes do you want to make? So at this point, you're generating the production package. Going back to our um, template uh, uh, pipeline, that's these items here. They all get pulled together, handed to the manufacturer as a design file, uh, package, a zip, whatever you want. Uh, put it on your file server. But when they, when the manufacturer, when they, when when they receive this, they'll usually apply a person, um, an engineer, who will look at your files. And they'll provide technical questions, technical inquiries. Every part of the world has a different term for this. I call them TQs. Uh, it just means manufacturers asking you, oh, hey, uh, you specified 10 mil clearance here. We only support 12. What do you want? Do you want to pull it back? Do you want to fix it? Uh, or if you don't, it's going to burr. You know, that, that's, a, that's a really common question that you get. And uh, generally, a good manufacturer will provide you with a list of technical inquiries you know, uh, on a on a new PCB with experienced designers, maybe it's 8 to 10. It can be a lot more if you made the same mistake many, many times. And at that point, you have a decision. Do you just approve it or decline them outright? Or do you loop back and go back through the design review process, right? So this is a lot. I'm just going through the, the workflow of, of working with this and then how CICD accomplishes that. So when you're done with your pre-release, your TQs are happy. You're happy with the TQ answers. Uh, you're satisfied your board's going to be made right. You do a release for production. So that means, okay, you give the go-ahead to the manufacturer. But this is the big thing. You generate a change notice. Even if you're not in a change control industry, this is your change log. If you look at an open source project and they don't have a change log and they don't have a readme, you're going to be like, what the hell is this? Well, this is the hardware equivalent of that. You generate a change notice. The change notice says what reference designators change, what parts have changed other small things like that. It's a formal record or announcement of the product change. It doesn't have to be formal. Really, you're just informing your users, you're informing your customers, you're informing the manufacturers what changed in your design so that when they look at your files, maybe they're not going to notice that you changed one letter in a note, and that is a really consequential letter. But if you call it out on the change notice, they will. Um, the small disclaimer. If you're in an audited industry, uh, like semiconductor or aviation, uh, no claim is made that this is auditable. Consult with your uh, quality person. So one thing that you can do at this point, you can write another job. And a job is one of these little bubbles here. And at that point, you can start doing more interesting things. You can push the output of your production or your design into whatever databases or file servers, or whatever you're using in order to distribute this information. So at this point, um, we've covered kind of the workflow as I see it. And, and then now I'm going to move into the template for this and, and how it kind of achieves these goals. And the goal is to implement this workflow on some level. Oh, well, before we move that, so enterprise, enterprise grade, this is my little joke. So these are a few other things we can consider. Uh, you can feed forward. So you can create in, uh, jobs or automated steps that can provide board support automatically for the software developers. Board support packages are pin muxes, if you're working with microcontrollers, uh, values for whatever analog components you have. Oh, what is the zero set point value for some analog input? Who knows? You need to provide that to the, to the software people, hopefully as a hash defined in a C file, maybe some other form, whatever. But you provide a board support package. Every, Every chip manufacturer, every board manufacturer will, will do this for you if you pay them to do it. So you should do it yourself if you're an open source designer. Feed backwards. Uh, in this process, you can also have the software mechanicals feed their requirements in. Obviously, materials manufacturers, sometimes manufacturers request changes like we covered. Other times, parts go obsolete all the time. Uh, you need to know and track this. You want to feed it into your design as part of the process. Uh, you want to be able to document when that obsolescence happens, when you change that part. You know, memories go out of stock all the time. Sometimes memories just disappear. Anyway, uh, quality control, purchasing. So, oh, sorry, we're good. Uh, this is more 
enterprise corporate stuff, but order, order material tracking, it's a big can of worms. I don't recommend it, but maybe somebody will look at it. Right, so what infrastructure am I using? Well, I have version control and a build server. I'm using Git and GitLab CI. Um, I have a dedicated server, but you can use a VM or you can use a container. There's an orchestration, orchestration script, I use a make file. There's an output script, I use Python. So the template project is available online at these websites. Um, it's pretty simple. There's an empty KiCad folder, a CI/CD folder with, script, with a script, and a make file, and then GitLab CI, which has the orchestration information. So GitLab CI is a YAML file. It's really simple. Um, I'm not going to go through most of it. This is the image that I created that has all the environment information, uh, has KiCad installed, some other utilities. And that's the environment in which all these scripts run. Not your installed environment, but in this controlled environment. Um, there's, I define several stages. Not, you know, stages are just descriptors. But this is the job. I'm plotting Gerbers. This is part of the fab outputs. It's a typo. It's supposed to be build. What do I do? I call a make file. I call a CI plot, CI uh, schematic. When do I do it? Always. But I only do it when I have a master branch or a tag. This is a release step, basically. Um, and I produce outputs that I put in a folder, and if I don't save them, they get deleted in a day. That way I don't take up too much room, right? So this is one type form of orchestration. You can use a pretty much any other form if you want. Um, if you're using Travis, you have your own file. What is a make file? Well, a make file is just, the, you can use any system. Make file is just a good way to script automated steps. So I want to plot some, oh, this is hard to see, I'm sorry. But I want to plot something, I call Python, I call the plot script, I call the input file, and I get the output file. Uh, I want to plot something else, I use a different command. So everything is automated and I create a separate job. I can run it locally, I can run it automatically, but I create a separate job for every major automated step I want. And then if I want to test it while I'm working, I just do it on my local computer. The outputs are different than what's in CI. Well, you know, check your environment. Uh, plotting script, right, so this is using, Python, I'm not gonna, this isn't a Python tutorial, but this is a plotting script. This is all boilerplate, what's the brains? Uh, I pick my layers, I open them, I open a plot file, I plot it, I close it, I'm done. Um, you can apply this concept pretty much to anything, any language, uh, well, there's a previous talk discussing C Sharp, no reason it has to be in Python. Um, and, and that's a key point, just that, um, that there's no, there's no uh, constraint on the workflow. I'm just proposing, basically a proposing a, um, a way to automate any workflow you want, and there's no, there's no requirement you have to follow my workflow. You can automate any workflow you want if you can define it well. So I'm pretty much done, but who is it for? Enterprises and ventures, obviously. Open source projects, well, it helps enable collaboration, and you have history for confused users. How many questions ask, when did this change? Well, you can always just point to the commit and the, and the pipeline. Freelance designers, account for your time, keep the clients in the loop, it makes them happy. You know, they're more likely to pay you on time. Uh, solo designers, well, you work on multiple projects, you wanna switch back and forth, it's a pain in the butt. So, you use this system, you can switch back and forth without having any, any trouble. You don't go insane, do it right once. Also, remember that project you made five years ago? Well, now I wanna get 10 more of them. What do you do? You go back to your, your outputs. Um, so basically everyone, uh, and apply your own scripts, whatever you feel like. Uh, and thank you, so I acknowledge everybody. Chris, thank you for organizing this, uh, this event, uh, the KiCad team for the awesome software, I'm Hub for hosting, all the sponsors and supporters, uh, PS1 for the awesome social event yesterday, and uh, all of you, the attendee, uh, thank you. We probably have time for one or two quick questions, so. How long does your build process take? In, in terms of end-to-end -end execution, um, maybe a minute at most, yeah. Uh, I mean, so some of that depends on how complex your steps are and what you're doing. If you're pushing to databases, sometimes rules can be really complicated, but yeah. Minute or two at most. Is your change log, change log also like automated in a script? How do you generate it? So, yeah, I, I, you you can automate it absolutely. Um, in, in this particular case, in this in in this system, uh, I mean, 
it, the way I do it, I just post it as a, as a change log in a, in a, a associated with the tag. But you can automate that as well, especially if you have another way of publishing that. Say a website or a blog. Everybody knows GitHub has uh, GitHub pages. You can have your CI scripts just take your changes and put them on the new, new pages. And then now you have an updated change log available publicly, yeah. Uh, what's the biggest issue you've had with this process? The biggest issue? Yeah, uh, well, I'd say two things. One is uh, it, it gets confusing uh, when you have multiple environments that you're juggling, your local environment. So the way I solve that is by using Docker because you can run it locally or remotely. You run it locally, you have the same exact environment. Um, uh, the other challenge is you, know, you need connectivity to your, to your system. You can run it on your own laptop and things like that, but uh, sometimes, it, sometimes if you have to... Um, uh, if you have to do something and it doesn't match when you're doing it locally versus when you're doing it remotely, that can cause, cause problems and so you have to spend time resolving it, yeah. For uh, symbol libraries for schematics, how are you dealing with that? Are you just sticking with the standard KiCad ones or are you checking them into your repo or how, how does the CI make sure that it has the right symbol libraries? Right, that's a really good question and, and um, Originally, I, I thought of making this more about the little details like that, and there was a lot more talks than I expected on those. Personally, uh, personally, I keep my own library, and I, and I use it as a, um, a sub-module within Git. Uh, it's totally viable to use a locally stored library per repository, or to have a sub-module or an external repository. There's no reason, there's nothing limiting in the script from you pulling another repository as part of that. So whatever is more convenient for you. Basically, yeah. All right. Uh, I think we have one more question here. This is a little bit into the weeds, but I saw that you're using EE Show to do your schematic generation. I haven't managed to make it go with modern schematics. Are you finding it reliable? In in version with version five schematics? Yeah. Yeah. You have to. So. Um, oh. Uh, there is a small detail, basically. Uh, it doesn't support KiCad 5, uh, and so you, uh, and, and the, real, the real difference is that KiCad 5 has references to the library. So as long as you tell it where to look for the libraries, um, I think it works. You know, I have to get back to you because I may have put a patch. Uh, up for, yeah, okay, yeah. It, it's a small change, regardless, yeah. Um, what's your take on um, leaving multiple revisions of Gerber files in a, in a Git repo? Uh, the, recently I was yelled at by software developers that you should only have the latest and greatest um, you know, uh, uh, of, of the files or you should make a branch. Um, and in my experience, like uh, when you're fabricating things, like you want the manufacturer to be able to go back and look two revs back and say, oh, here's where the mistake is. Yeah, um, so this, the way I described it here, you're not committing the Gerbers, so they're, they're associated with the build system, and so they're stored as par part of the build. They, they are stored in database, but they're not part of the Git repository. So, so they're, they're basically, when the, when the pipeline runs, you get zip files you can download from the system. If you're using GitHub, it's coming from Travis. Uh, the answer to your question, though, is uh, I, if you do commit Gerbers, you should probably commit the latest version. Uh, when you're, so, so you, you, you I don't want to start an argument over it, but if you're developing and, and you make a step where you're generating the Gerbers, you commit those Gerbers, and then you move on. And, and at some point, if there's enough, a major enough change, you commit them again. I don't know if it's necessary to, if you're actually committing your Gerbers to do it every single time. I haven't found much value in that, but if you are, then just be consistent. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you.